Ethernet won the LAN market versus several early competitors. The others just disappeared. Follow along this video and learn the basics of Ethernet LANs, which reveals a couple of the reasons why Ethernet won. First, let me set the context of this video in the overall course. With all the videos in this playlist, I mirror the content of the official CERT guides. So this video matches Volume 1, Chapter 2, as you see in the slide, and in particular, the first of four sections in that chapter. That's the Ethernet Overview section. So in this video, I'll break the content down into the headings that you see there. We'll talk a bit about the physical layer, particularly some standards with sending data over unshielded twisted pair, that is copper links with Ethernet. And then we'll talk about data link layer frames and how those can flow across Ethernet links. In the opening, I told you that Ethernet won the land market. So stick around to the end of the video and I'll make sure you understand why the technologies that I talk about during the video helped Ethernet win. Also, as always, stick around to the end. For those of you that have the books, I'll make sure you're clear on what else in that matching book section you need to look at beyond what I cover in this video. But for everyone, stick till the end, and I'll point you to a review exercise so you can review and study the content of this video. All right, let's get into the good stuff. One of the first skills to learn is how to interpret a diagram that includes some Ethernet components. For instance, here we have an Ethernet LAN switch at the top of the diagram with three PCs connected with some type of Ethernet cabling. The LAN switch identifies each port or interface with an interface ID. The ID starts with the type of interface, which is a G in this case, which is shorthand for Gigabit Ethernet which means the fastest speed it can use is one gigabit. Then those numbers separated by slashes identify the port on the side of the device. The manufacturer decides how to number those. So Cisco for this model of switch uses three numbers separated by those slashes there. Now we can't tell from the figure, but I'm telling you that the diagram would probably somehow identify that you're using copper cabling, and we'll refer to that as unshielded twisted pair or UTP cabling, because when they make the cables, they create them in pairs. The two pairs of wires are twisted together in the manufacturing process. That cuts down on electrical interference, which is a good thing. So you'll hear Ethernet cabling referred to as UTP cabling. Now there are lots and lots of Ethernet physical layer standards. It's all part of the IEEE 802.3 standard. So the standard itself is a huge PDF document, but there are individual parts that define different physical layer standards. Here are four of them that occurred over some number of years, as you can see in this year added column in the center of the table. You can also see that as time progressed down the table, that the speed increased 10x, right? It went from 10 meg to 100 meg to 1000 meg, 1000 meg equaling one gigabit per second, and then up to 10 gig. And the reason I mention these in that progression is that over those years, Ethernet won the land war, if you will. They beat their competitors, and part of it was with inexpensive UTP cabling, you could go faster and faster. So eventually they got faster than all their competitors with honestly cheaper cabling and oftentimes cheaper hardware required on the ends of the cables. So that's some of the reasons why Ethernet won. So a couple of things here on the names on the left, the base T, the T refers to the unshielded twisted pair or UTP cabling. So all of these are UTP based standards. 10 with a base means 10 meg, 100 with a base implies 100 meg, 1000 with base implies 1000 meg, and then they change the naming for the next one historically to 10 G base. Notice the G. So the G base implies gigabit speed, so it's 10 gig with that naming there. Final thing here, notice all of them support 100 meters of distance with the idea that in a typical floor in a typical building, from the wiring closet to anywhere else on the floor, it's less than 100 meters. So UTP cabling can be used in a typical floor in pretty much any building. All right, so analyzing these together then, 
the folks that create Ethernet, the IEEE, increase the speed 10x every four to five years over those years, all supporting 100 meters. They did require, though, a slightly better cabling quality so that people knew that next time they're going to refurbish a building, they want to increase and get the better cabling type to support those future fast speeds. Next up, let's revisit that same diagram that we saw before and talk about another feature of Ethernet that's important. It's called IEEE Auto Negotiation. These gigabit interfaces often can support gigabit or 1000 megabits per second, but also the slower speeds, just in case the devices connected to them are older and can only connect at slower speeds. For instance, on laptops A, B, and C, laptop B has a card that's older and only supports 10 and 100 megabits per second. So A and C support one gigabit or a thousand meg. They would auto negotiate to use the best or highest speed, but this one in the middle only supports a hundred. So likewise, port two up here on the switch would agree to only use a hundred meg. Here's a photo of a switch just so you can see what it looks like. There are a lot of ports here. These ports, they're rectangular and we refer to those as RJ45 ports. That's the name of the connector. So the cable looks like this. It's got a clip on the side. You plug it into one of the ports. This particular switch model comes with 24 of these RJ45 ports. They all happen to be 10, 100, 1000 auto negotiating ports. And a lot of times switches will come with some ports where you can add and remove hardware to change the physical link that's supported on the port. In this case there are four such ports and the hardware that you can put in and take out is called a small form factor pluggable or SFE port, SFP port. And with those you can plug in and then say you can support other physical air standards like those that allow longer distances using fiber optic cabling. Why would you want longer distances? Why would you want fiber optic cabling when you've got this nice, cheap, unshielded, twisted pair? Well, let's just imagine switches A1 and A2 are sitting in a rack together. Well, you'd use unshielded, twisted pair between them. It's inexpensive. The ports are inexpensive. Just use those. But what if these two were 300 meters apart in two different buildings in the same office park? Well, you can't run a link that uses unshielded twisted pair and have it work at 300 meters. It's way outside the standard. So we need some physical layer standards that support longer distances and often those use fiber optic cabling. So that's part of the design criteria you have to think about with Ethernet LANs. So let's talk about those for just a moment. Here's one such standard. It's 1000 base, so it's 1000 megabits or one gigabit per second. And this SX refers to using um, short for fiber, but short fiber links. That's some of the code there. Now the original standard, when it came out, there was a cable quality referred to as OM1, and that's all that was out at the time. And it supported a 220 meter length that you see there. OM stands for optical multimedia, if you want the trivia there. And so that was great. And then there was an OM2 created, which was better, and an OM3, and an OM4, which you might commonly find today. And inside this one standard, we can get up to, per the standard at least, 860 meters going at one gig on that fiber cable. So if your two switches were, say, 800 meters apart, in theory, you should be able to connect and use this standard at this one gigabit per second speed on a link between those switches. As you might guess, there are lots of these kinds of standards. So here's another one, 10 G base SR. It's another fiber standard. The S is a reference to that. It's got a G base, not a base. So that's a reference to we're talking about numbers of gigabits per second. So it's 10 gigabits per second. So we've got the easy reference here. It's a 10 gig standard. Now, when it came out, OM1 was a little bit older cabling type, but just so you see it, you can get up to 33 meters at this faster speed 
at 10 gigabits per second. But it was designed for newer cabling types like with an OM4 cable you can get up to 400 meters. So again, those two switches between buildings, you could run 10 gig with a 300 meter distance between the buildings and get more capacity between the buildings. All right, so a couple of big ideas here as you see in the arrow lines around. So looking inside one standard, the better cabling gets you longer distances. Looking downward, comparing an, an older, slower standard to a newer, faster standard, to get the higher speed, you're going to get a little less distance on whatever cable you're using, right? 220 versus 33 meters, 860 versus 400. So a little less distance, but a little better speed. So it's a trade-off that you have to think about. Now let's talk about what flows over those physical links. Ethernet defines both layer 1 details and layer 2 details from the TCP IP model. At layer 2, it defines this frame format that you see on the screen now. That includes the header on the left and the trailer on the right, and then what you'll find in that data and pad would be, for instance, an IP packet. Most importantly in there are this destination and source address fields. So when two devices on an Ethernet LAN want to communicate, the sender uses its address as the source and it puts the destination that it wants to receive this data in as the destination address. To give some meaning to that, let's take a closer look. Say if PC11 wants to send data to PC12, they'll have Ethernet addresses, we call those MAC addresses, and it'll send a frame into the switch. The switch will somehow figure out to send that down to PC12. In a larger LAN like this one with host A2, maybe it's that uh, switch in another building, the frame might come in to switch A1, get sent to switch A2, and say it's destined for PC22. There it goes over to PC22. Maybe it's an even larger LAN. You've got lots and lots of those access switches, as we call them at the bottom of the picture, not shown. Maybe there's 40 or 50 or 60 of those with endpoints connected and maybe some, just a few of these kind of switches up here labeled D1 and D2. But say PC11 again wants to send data to PC22, the frame might come in here, might go up here, over here, over here, and so on through the network, always with that source and destination address in the header. And just to emphasize the point, let's, let's take a look at some of those frames. Here's a generic drawing that shows that Ethernet frame with the header on the left and trailer on the right, the data is probably an IP packet. And it goes from PC11 up to its connected switch, and then switch A1 forwards to some other switch, like maybe switch D1, who forwards over to D2, forwards over to A2, and forwards over to PC22. Now we're gonna talk about this over and over and get into why switches do that and why hosts do that. But for this Ethernet basics discussion, we just talked about a process that completely ignored the physical link types, ignored the cabling types. That logic of sending an Ethernet frame to the next switch, to the next switch, to the next switch, all of those physical links could be any of the physical layer standards. And that's one of the beautiful things about Ethernet, and one of the reasons it succeeded so much in the LAN marketplace was it's the same Ethernet frame format all over the place. So it's kind of like when you buy a car, you just assume you can drive it on a, on your driveway and a one-lane road and a two-lane road and a bigger road and a super highway, right? Same thing here. It's an Ethernet frame. I send it from down here at PC11, but I'm assuming it's going to be able to flow over all these faster links that are used in fiber optics as it gets out into the rest of the network. All right, one last thing before we get away. Just to give you a little bit of insight into wireless while we're here at this overview, if you've got a wireless device like, say, a tablet, and you know it works, it's using Wi-Fi, what it's doing, it's talking with radio waves to a device called an access point. The access point physically connects then into the Ethernet. Now, it turns out this wireless technology is also defined by the IEEE. It's a committee called the 802.11 committee instead of the 802.3 committee. So, Everything here forward gets much more complex in reality, but in its simplest form, like maybe what you do at home, this wireless device sends an, a Wi-Fi frame, an 802.11 frame that has a header and trailer. And when it gets to the AP, 
it converts it to an Ethernet frame, and that's what gets sent out into the Ethernet network to other destinations, maybe goes out in the case of a home wireless network. It gets out to your internet connection and out into the internet that way. That wraps up the Ethernet fundamentals for this video. Let's talk about how to study for a little bit. First off, this video mirrors Volume 1, Chapter 2, Section 1 of the official CERT guide, which is an Ethernet overview as we talked about in the intro. So what else do you need from the book? Well, there's really just one thing in the book that you might want to go check out. There's a description of physical layer transmission that some people find interesting. It's probably not literally in the exam topics, but you might check those slides out and see what happens on a UTP cable for transmitting in both directions. Review activity. I promised up front that at the end I'd point you to a review activity. I've got a terminology mind map lined up for you here. If you don't know what those are, then watch the video about what those are. It's a separate video in the playlist. I won't repeat it every time, but it's good if you go ahead and do it now, but it's better if you'll wait a little bit, a day or two to do it, and even better if you'll schedule it so you don't forget to go do it. Now, these terminology mind maps start with a seed term. So the seed term for this one is 1000 base T. So if you get the idea, you can plan on doing that terminology mind map. If you don't, make sure to watch the video. It's linked in the show notes about what these terminology mind maps are. Ethernet 1, for many reasons, but a few that we talked about today include the fact that an Ethernet frame can flow over any of those types of links and others. Any Ethernet link supports the same Ethernet frame format. So the sender can send a frame knowing that no matter how the LAN was built, the frame should be able to be delivered to the other parts of the Ethernet LAN. The other thing is the IEEE is, they're just wonderful at creating new Ethernet standards that are effective for better distances over different types of cabling and getting to that 100 meter standard to reach everybody on one floor with increasingly fast distances. That really did help them win in the 1990s and early 2000s versus their competitors. In fact, there are tons more Ethernet physical layer standards, so if you find that interesting, check out the Ethernet Alliance. There's a link in the show notes. They have this great roadmap that shows all those different Ethernet standards in a really nice graphical way. So check it out. Hey, thanks everybody for sticking around through the entire video. If you're new to the channel, please subscribe and click the bell so you'll know about new videos as they come out for every video. Comment, like, and also share with others if you like the video. I appreciate you hanging with me and I'll see you next time.